Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to those who were with us for the previous session. Uh, let me warmly welcome you to the, uh, the college lecture of the Ceylon College of Physicians. So each month, uh, the college lecture and basically most of the activities of the college uh, are held jointly with uh, a sister college. So this month, it is the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. And I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Geetal Pereira, who is the president of the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. Uh, to uh, uh, join me uh, and thank you for collaborating with us uh, on these sessions. Uh, Dr. Geeta Pereira, would you like to take over and introduce the speaker today? Thank you very much uh, for agreeing to collaborate this month with the College of Pharmacologists. Today's uh, speaker is Dr. Divesha Vadasinghe. Uh, she uh, is a respiratory a consultant respiratory physician and a, and a lecturer attached to physiology department of the uh, North Colombo Teaching Hospital and the Faculty of Medicine, Kalania. Um, she is a trainee from uh, the National Hospital of Respiratory Medicine and she uh, did a further training in UK. We are very happy that uh, after her return from the foreign training, she has taken up uh, this uh, new uh, form of investigation, the cardiopulmonary exercise testing, about which she's going to talk to you today. Over to you, Dilesha. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for the very kind words of introduction. Uh, I consider it a very great privilege and an honor to be presenting the college lecture uh, of the Ceylon College of Physicians today on cardiopulmonary exercise testing, key to diagnosis of unexplained breathlessness. I have no financial disclosures to make regarding this topic, and I will be looking at the defini definitions of dyspnea, the causes of chronic dyspnea, and some diagnostic algorithms of chronic dyspnea available in literature, and then we'll be presenting our approach in the diagnostic evaluation using cardiopulmonary exercise testing and its other uses as well. So what is uh, dyspnea? The American Thoracic Society defines dyspnea as a subjective experience of breathing discomfort, which uh, consists of a qualitative distinct uh, sensation and would vary with uh, in intensity. In other terms, it is a subjective sensation of difficult, labored, uncomfortable breathing. We consider it to be acute when uh, it develops within hours to days and we consider it to be chronic when it develops more than four to uh, eight, when it is for more than four to eight weeks. So in this presentation, we will be fo focusing about the, the chronic um, dyspnea. So the chronic dyspnea can be due to a myriad of reasons, including cardiac causes, respiratory causes, hematological causes such as anemia, neuromuscular diseases, and some gastrointestinal diseases, some med metabolic diseases which are very, which are common as well, and psychological and other diseases which are not very common but you see quite often, such as upper airway obstruction, vocal cord dysfunction as well. So a prospective study carried uh, by Nelson et al. in 2001 showed that out of those myriad of courses which I showed in the previous slide, uh, with a examination, physical examination, ECG, and some basic investigations, uh, they could uh, achieve a diagnostic yield, for, yield of about 85% in, in patients who are referred for hospital care from the primary care. And also another study by Pedersen in 2007, which was on elderly patients uh, presenting to the primary care, showed that some investigations, uh, such as ECG spirometry together with some um, highly specialized investigations such as cardiac MRI and stress tests would give a diagnostic yield of almost 74%. So what happens to the remaining 15 to 25% of patients who are presenting with breathlessness? So these are the group of patients whom we see in clinics as patients with unexplained breathlessness. So it is a diagnostic challenge 
Uh, why? Because unexplained breathlessness is a common complaint and it can attribute to a wide spectrum of underlying diseases. It is uh, in some studies have showed that in about one third of cases, these these patients are having multifactorial uh, reasons. And the clinical assessment, as I said previously, is not diagnostic, even though it may point towards certain di diagnoses. And therefore, uh, it is difficult in selecting the most appropriate investigation for these patients and we are unable to refer them correctly to the correct specialty for the further diagnostic assessment. So, we are left with doing loads of investigations on these patients and we are taking fairly a long time to diagnose these patients based on simple history examination and basic investigations. I would like to bring your attention to these two observational studies, uh, which uh, with uh, Prater, by Prater et al. in 2011, where they have used cardiopulmonary exercise testing with a good yield in diagnosing these patients presenting to a tertiary or a specialist respiratory practice. So about overall 99% diagnostic yield when you include cardiopulmonary exercise testing in this uh, group. So, uh, what are the most common causes of unexplained dyspnea we see in these groups? Mostly it's primary lung or cardiac dysfunction, but also neuromuscular diseases, obesity, deconditioning, a condition called dysfunctional breathing, vocal cord dysfunction are also important causes to look. With my experience at the Royal Brompton Hospital during my overseas training in the unexplained breathlessness service, we have developed a similar work workup for our patients with the available resources. So the first step in our diagnosis is a thorough history and physical examination. As clinicians, we should never forget the importance of a thorough history, which may provide guidance in narrowing the diagnostic possibilities and selecting a appropriate diagnostic tests. And then we perform a detailed examination of the cardiovascular, respiratory, musculoskeletal, and the neurologic systems. The history should um, include all these aspects and we should take a thorough history and this uh, approach or this uh, uh, format can be used by any of the uh, trainees or any clinician to evaluate any patient with breathlessness. So we should get a thorough um, history in our patients. And the dyspnea should be gra graded using a validated score and we use the modified Medical Research Council dyspnea scale. So as the second step, we would uh, uh, do some basic investigations, uh, including a blood test, kidney liver functions, BNP, thyroid stimulating test, uh, hormone test, and then a, a chest x-ray and a ECG on our patients. Depending on the history, examination, and the initial basic investigations, we perform a full lung function test, including a cardiopulmonary exercise test in our patient. So what is a cardiopulmonary exercise test or CPEX or a CPET? So it is similar to a ECG stress test with addition of pulmonary parameters. So we do this by adding a mouthpiece uh, as shown in this picture or a mask to record a um, uh, the breath by breath analysis. We can do it on a cyclogometer or a treadmill and in uh, not in our centers but center but in Sri Lanka but in overseas centers they use uh, the CPET in combination with either ArtLine or a pulmonary artery catheter or laryngoscopy which gives further investigation and then that uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test is known as an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test. So why do we do a CPET? So a cardiopulmonary exercise test would give us information about cardiovascular respiratory muscle physiology during exercise. So we can use this test to evaluate unexplained dyspnea. We can use this test to assess which system contributes more to dyspnea in our patients with dual pathologies. We can use this to quantify fitness level in our patients. And we also can use this to, uh, as a preoperative assessment for surgical risk assessment in certain groups of patients. And and also, we can use this as an evaluation, exercise evaluation prior to pulmonary rehabilitation and 
a very important use of this is to measure response to intervention such as pulmonary rehabilitation or in heart failure uh, uh, treatment such as diuretic ther therapy. So you can uh, use this test to monitor the response to a given intervention. So during my presentation, we will be looking at how to use CPET for evaluate unexplained dyspnea. When we are talking about CPET, we cannot forget Dr. Kalman Wasserman, who is an uh, American physiologist who has worked uh, extensively in pulmonary physiology. He is considered the pioneer in CPET and the founder of the Wasserman 9 panel plot, which is the standard graphical representation of the uh, data we gather in cardiopulmonary exercise testing. He also described the gear wheel model, model which we use to explain the results obtained from exercise testing which I will show you later and he defined the anaerobic threshold and showed us how to uh, determine the anaerobic, anaerobic threshold using the ventilatory cardiovascular gas exchange responses. So what do we do uh, measure during a C, during CPET? We measure the oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, the heart rate, blood pressure, ECG, saturation using a pulse oximeter, ideally in the ear or the forehead, and uh, the entire carbon dioxide. So this is the gear wheel model described by Wasserman, which shows the gas transport mechanisms coupling the cellular respiration, which is the internal respiration, to the pulmonary respiration, which is the external respiration. So you looking at this diagram, we can uh, determine that exercise tolerance is determined by three factors. And what are they? The pulmonary gas exchange, the cardiovascular performance, including the peripheral vasculatory and then the skeletal muscle metabolism. So when we are uh, talking about functional exercise testing, we should understand the fixed equation, uh, which is of paramount importance. It would consider all physiologic abnormalities that can alter the body's uh, consumption of oxygen. And it states that the oxygen consumption, which is VO2, equals to the cardiac output times the uh, difference between the arterial oxygen contents to the mixed venous oxygen content. So the cardiac output from our medical stool days we know can be obtained by heart rate times the stroke volume and any lung disease causing hypoxemia, anemia, hemoglobinopathies which reduce the oxygen carrying capacity or intracardiac shunts can cause a reduction in the arterial oxygen content and even though not very common, uh, myopathies and neurological diseases which can reduce the oxygen consumption or the metabolism of, of, of oxygen oxygen in peripheries uh, should not be forgotten. So before we look at what is uh, how to interpret abnormal, what is let's look at what is limiting the, a normal person's exercise. So a normal person's exercise would be limited by reaching his maximum cardiac limit. So if you go back to the FIC equation, uh, we can see that the cardiac output is limited by the heart rate. So when a normal subject reaches their maximum heart rate, we see that about 25 to 30 percent of his ventilatory reserve is left. But having said that, the athletes can reach, ventilatory, reach their ventilatory mechanics, mechanical limits while they are reaching their cardiac limits as well. So, in, an, in the initial part of the uh, exercise, we do an aerobic respiration and the oxygen consumption, as shown in the gray line here, go, goes up. Carbon dioxide increases proportionately and so does the um, minute ventilation. So, once the anaerobic threshold is reached, the uh, aer uh, aerobic respiration is supplemented by anaerobic uh, rest metabolism to produce energy. Therefore, the lactate level gradually increases, but the body buffering systems come into play and therefore the pH remains stable. The oxygen continues to, uh, oxygen consumption continues to increase and then there are two sources now which produce carbon dioxide in the body. One is the exercising muscle and then the other is by the buffering of H plus ions from the from lactate. Therefore, the oxygen uh, production is increasing out of proportion to the 
uh, sorry, the carbon dioxide production is increasing out of proportion to the oxygen consumption. And therefore, the ventilation or the minute ventilation too increases out of proportion to the oxygen consumption, but it is proportionate to the carbon dioxide production. So as exercise progresses, the lactate starts building in the body. The buffering systems are uh, exhausted. They cannot buffer anymore. And then the pH starts decreasing. So at this point, metabolic acidosis sets in. So the oxygen continues to, oxygen consumption continues to increase. Carbon dioxide production continues to increase out of proportion to oxygen consumption. And uh, now there are two uh, mechanisms or two reasons why the ventilation could increase. One is the production of uh, carbon dioxide. The other one is the body trying to buffer the metabolic acidosis. So the ventilation, minute ventilation would increase steep. So this is what happens in usual person. So when you are in, interpreting the uh, exercise uh, test, uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test, we try to basically answer two questions. Is, is the peak oxygen consumption normal in our subject? And if not, what is the reason for the exercise limitation? So the CPET would give us whether it's a cardiovascular limitation, whether it's a ventilatory limitation, whether it's a pulmonary vascular disease, deconditioning, is it dysfunctional breathing or is it a submaximal exercise test or whether is it other causes such as anemia, anemia obesity or um, anemia or obesity. Okay, so uh, as I told previously, so CPET would uncover patterns of psychological uh, physiologic impairment and guide further investigation. So now we can guide further investigation depending on which system is limiting the exercise. So the diagnosis would be uh, quicker and we can go for a management plan easier and uh, easily and also we don't want to spend a lot of um, money on doing various ex uh, investigations trying to find a diagnosis in these patients. So I will not go in detail into these uh, patterns, but then there are various patterns in various diseases identified uh, by uh, researchers by uh, test, uh, testing the exercise uh, capacity or the cardiopulmonary exercise capacities in various diseases. Uh, so in when you're talking about the pulmonary exercise limitation we can identify three patterns basically one is the ventilatory mechanical defect where you would see that the patient is reaching not the cardiac limitation but the ventilatory mechanical limitation where the ventilatory reserve is reduced than the cardiac reserve and also there will be abnormal vq mismatch suggestive of abnormal gas exchange and the parameter we use it is the VE that's the minute ventilation by the VCO2 that's a carbon dioxide production. So this would tell us whether this is uh, the, the patient with a ventilator limitation has problems in gas exchange either due to increased dead space ventilation such seen such as uh, in my patients with pulmonary hypertension or whether it is a ventilatory reduction in ventilation seen in obstructive lung conditions. And then also we would see a reduction in diffusion uh, noted by a drop in saturation which we monitor throughout the uh, test. Okay, so I'll, this, is, this shows again that the uh, in COPD, ILD, which are lung conditions, you see that the peak heart rate is decreased means that there is more heart rate reserve and the um, ventilation divided by the minute ventilation times 100, which is the breathing reserve, is increased or uh, normal or in, slightly increased in uh, lung conditions, giving us a low breathing reserve. So this is one of our patients. So you can see in this patient, um, who is a 19 year old girl who came who is a non patient with asthma but is complaining of breathlessness so in this uh, study you can see that the maximum oxygen consumption is 97% of the predicted which is below 80% so it's slightly marginally reduced the patient has uh, re uh, reached 80% uh, of the predicted workload which suggests that it's a fairly good attempt in this patient and the 
when looking at the reserves, you see the heart, cardiac reserve is 34. So usually we tell that the cardiac re reserve is uh, limited when it reaches above, above 15. So there is more cardiac reserve left in our patient. And remember I told you that when the cardiac res re uh, reserve reaches in a normal person, you have about 25 to 30% of the breathing reserve left. But then in this patient, it's only 17% left. So this patient is clearly limited by his respiration or vent ventilation and also this parameter here which is the equivalent for carbon dioxide which would suggest whether there is a VQ mismatch is slightly uh, high at the anaerobic threshold suggesting that there is some degree of VQ mismatch in this patient as well. So, looking at the flow volume loops in the patient, so we can see that, so in if there is airway obstruction, we would expect that this expiratory limb would go out of this uh, gray line, which is the normal um, flow volume loop, expiratory flow volume loop, uh, line of the, of the patient. So, in this, it slightly, slightly goes above, but then remember, this is asthmatic who is on inhaler treatment as well. So, they, maybe her asthma is not that well controlled in this patient but he she did, did not show any uh, dynamic hyperinflation where this graph shows dynamic hyperinflation where with each um, uh, while ex exercise progresses we see that this loop shifts towards the left suggesting dynamic hyperinflation so this patient shows that she is limited by her respiration and there is some degree of airway obstruction still, but it does not fall in the cutoff values what we uh, use to uh, define airway obstruction. So this is another a disease, uh, this another condition actually, which is missed by our common investigation, which is dysfunctional breathing. It is a breathing disorder where there is chronic changes in the breathing pattern resulting in dyspnea or um, increased work of breathing. You will see mild hyperinflation, uh, irregular rate, respiratory rate and volume of respiration and frequent sign in this patient. Studies have shown that in patients with dysfunctional functional breathing, fluoroscopic studies show the diaphragms becomes flattened and hypertonic with relative immo relatively immobile. And therefore, because the diaphragm is your main uh, respiratory, inspiratory uh, muscle, so if it doesn't function well, then your intercostals and your accessory muscles starts to contribute more, re uh, resulting in increased work of breathing and perception of dyspnea. So this is another patient uh, whom we tested. You can see clearly that her, her breathing pattern is very erratic. Some large breaths here, some shallow breaths, and then very irregular breathing pattern throughout the test. And the uh, respiratory rate is very scattered. Uh, there is, it's all over the place actually. So such patients, what we did is we identified the cause and then patients would, uh, the dyspnea would improve with breathing re, um, uh, retraining. So th uh, this patient underwent a couple of sessions with breathing exercise retraining and we are waiting to do her repeat uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test. So before I finish, I would like to just introduce to another two entities which present with exertional breathlessness and wheeze. And we see this in some of the very high-end athletes as well, which is ILO or the exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction and exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. So this graph shows clearly that the in ILO, the uh, peak uh, symptom intensity is at peak exercise but in exercise induced breathlessness it is soon after the peak exercise and in this condition inhalers help but in here inhalers does not help if you listen carefully you can hear a inspiratory strido in these patients so how to diagnose this? I, I, uh, how to diagnose ILO is by combining CPET with a continuous laryngeal examination, laryngoscopic e examination. So this is how it is done. And I was very fortunate to see this as uh, assisting two patients uh, being um, un undergoing these investigations during my overseas training. And you can see clearly that at peak exercise, the supraglottic area is closing leading to airway obstruction and strido in these patients. So uh, this cardiopulmonary exercise test 
incorporating into this uh, unexplained breathlessness would give us some diagnosis which we don't get in through usual um, exam uh, investigations and it is a reassurance actually for th these patients because they know that their breathlessness is real but nothing in their nothing something in their head okay so in summary uh, i would say that a card the cardiopulmonary exercise testing would give us a lot of physiologic abnorm uh, specific physiologic abnormalities integrating the cardiopulmonary uh, system the neuromuscular systems and uh, would give us an idea about what contributes to the persistent breathlessness and also it can uncover these patterns of physiologic imp impairment and hence can guide us for further investigations and lead to a uh, uh, early diagnosis and uh, early management plan in these patients presenting with unexplained breathlessness. I would like to thank my um, supervisors in, in, in my, during my overseas training, Professor Jim Hull and Dr. Shamila Vitana, uh, who uh, helped me to get myself trained in this uh, new, um, not new, but uh, new to us actually, uh, exercise testings. And also I would like to thank Amita, uh, Dr. Amita Fernando, uh, who is a respiratory consultant, consultant respiratory physician at War LHS Clinic for his uh, contribution in initiating these tests in Sri Lanka. Dr. Bandhu Gunasena, my uh, local trainee for his uh, continuing support uh, in achieving these goals and Dr. Lakmali Amarasiri who is a senior lecturer in physiology for her um, valuable contribution in starting CPET in Sri Lanka and also last but not least uh, Mr. Chaturanga Jailath who is a physiotherapist who does cardiopulmonary exercise tests in our unit and all my teachers and trainers who contributed um, to my success. Thank you. Thank you, Dilisha, for that wonderful lecture and introducing a new entity to the clinical practice. And uh, now is the time for question and answers. Uh, yeah, Gitar, would you like to ask uh, a question? Yeah, just because of the constraints of time, shall I ask uh, one question? Now, uh, since we have started this uh, investigation in Sri Lanka, uh, can you please explain for the benefit of the, the, the listeners the, the, the referral process and what kind of patients and how somebody who uh, who sh should be referred for this and also on your side uh, the 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 time spent on a test like this in case somebody is interested in setting up uh, 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 this test in a place uh, maybe in jeff now wherever so the time constraints and the the rough cost of uh, uh, this uh, kind of investigation so um this uh, so the process of referring is unfortunately we uh, do it only in private sector because we uh, have the uh, in, uh, facilities in private sector so uh, we do it at king's hospital and uh, so uh, on on the on a friday clinic so the thing is we spend about an hour with a patient with a history examination then the basic investigations and then uh, assessing for the suitability and then the test or, or itself would take about 12 minutes or so but then the pre-preparation and then afterwards the recovery pre period monitoring so it takes roughly about one hour per patient and also because it's currently the COVID season so we do a COVID PCR test before the test because it is a aerosol generating procedure and then 40 minutes afterwards cleaning uh, before we test another patient. So uh, patients could be referred uh, who are in, uh, to to the King's Hospital actually, and then but then I, I know that then in the state sector we have uh, the facility at Jayavardhanapur Hospital which will be starting uh, soon I hope. Yeah, Dilisha, there's another question. Come to the Zoom uh, chat box. Are you performing CPET to assess the cardiopulmonary fitness in athletics? For, to assess cardiopulmonary in, in athletics. Yes. So actually, what I do is I do see athletics who are having problems in breathing uh, and assess their fitness or whether they have any problem re uh, causing breathlessness in these patients. But then um, for the... 
to ass- just assess the fitness actually we have uh, the a sports physician who is doing uh, exercise prescription for these athletics in the in our same service actually so for if the patient is not having breathlessness or a problem in breathing uh, i don't see them i they, they are seen by the sports physician to uh, for an exercise pres- prescription but then i see the i usually tend to see the patients who are having problems in breathing actually I suppose this test can be used uh, for uh, assessment of training programs, whether they are effective and fitness yes, of course. to send somebody for Olympics and all that. You know? Yes, yes, of course. They can be used because it, not only for the training programs, even for our pulmonary rehabilitation, we can do it before and see whether our training program has improved. And even for the patients with deconditioning, when we diagnose some patient breathlessness, deconditioning is the diagnosis. We put them on a training program and then assess their improvement afterwards so this can be used to uh, to assess their current performance and whether the training programs have been effective or not as well yeah uh, on behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians uh, I would like to hand over the certificate of appreciation uh, for that wonderful lecture and your explanations <laughs> Yeah, and uh, thank you, Geetha, for uh, joining with us today and also the Sri Lanka College of Palmologists collaborating this month and this is our first event and there are two events uh, in future. And uh, on behalf of the Sri Lanka College of Physicians, uh, I would like to thank the our sponsors, the CIPLA for the YPF and also the GSK for their college lecture and our audiovisual staff and the staff of the Clinmark and staff of the CCP. And uh, all the audience we, uh, who have joined us in virtually today, and uh, we will uh, come back to you with the specialty update and the expert webinar in the uh, next few weeks. Thank you so much. <laughs>